chapter 18, it does start off telling you about the differences between managerial and financial accounting, right? So I've already told you one main difference. I told you that this does not come from the perspective of um, looking at financial statements and analyzing financials, but it comes from the perspective of the manufacturer, okay? Um, managerial or management accountant really take financial information reports and everything, and they use them to make very important day-to-day -day decisions. That's different from financial, right? Financial, they do the reports at the end of the year, that year-end reporting or month-end reporting, and then they take that information and make decisions based on whether or not the company is profitable, whether or not the cash flow is accurate, whether or not to purchase invest, uh, you know, invest in things. And managerial comes from a totally different aspect because they don't want month-to-month, -month, they do want month-to-month -month reports. They're, they can't afford to wait until the end of the year. So they're more so on a daily, sometimes weekly basis, meaning I need to see a performance report for the week because I need to determine whether or not we were at our full productivity for the week and how we're gonna go into next week. Are we gonna go into next week with the same amount of laborers? Are we gonna go into next week with the same amount of products and raw materials to produce, right? So this is why they use that information. Now, purpose of managerial accounting. Notice the top item is monitoring, right? What do you think they monitor? I just told you. Operations. Day-to-day -day operations, right? So they monitor day-to-day -day operations and they use that information that they get to make some strategic plans, long-term and both short-term. Obviously, they need to make annual budgets. I didn't say reports, uh, financial reports, but budgets, meaning estimation. Um, they also monitor so that they can control measurement of different items they can evaluate uh operations and sometimes oversee them more strictly so this is the same chart that's in your book it's on page 711 oh 735 sorry just giving you a breakdown of the difference between both financial and managerial accounting so First thing, users and decision makers. We know in financial accounting, the users are the internal people, right? Mm -hmm. And who else? Internal and what else? External people. Because the internal people are obviously the big wigs, the people at the top of the chain, right? Mm -hmm. But the external are the outside angel investors, the creditors, obviously, because the business owes them, right? Loaners, anybody that feeds money into the business is concerned in a financial aspect. Managerial, that's totally internal. Mm -hmm. Meaning the only people that care about that information are managers, higher up and lower level, right? The employees that work for them, the decision makers or people like the board, the people that are on the inside and make decisions about where money comes from, how money goes out. Purpose of information for financial accounting, we did financial reports for the sake of making sure that the people who loaned us money will keep loaning us money. We did financial statements for um, people who were interested in investing in our company because that was the only way we were going to get some outside funds, right? Managerial accounting means that the information is used strictly for doing what? Budgeting and making some serious decisions about how money flows, inflows, outflows. Flexibility of practice. Financial accounting is always structured and controlled by GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, right? And now if you are international, it will be IFRS. But whew, management, flex, 
relatively flexible, no gap constraints. Why do you think there's no gap restraints? It's going to be hard to do that in managerial accounting if they're going piece by piece and day by day things are changing and fluctuating, right? So they can't be really as structured as someone who is um, more so financial accounting. Um, timeliness of information. How often do you do reports under financial accounting, financial reports, or financial statements? Monthly, quarterly, annually, right? They say here that information is only available when? Final audit, right? This is the reason why you don't see an annual report for a business until when? For the previous year. January, some of them do February, some of them it may be all the way up until April 15th before you see the report for the previous year because they have been doing their audit and that's the only time they can release that information out to the public. They can't do it prior to then. Timeliness of information for managerial, that needs to be available when? Right now. Right now. We don't care if it's not accurate, but we need some estimates. Time dimension. Financial accounting focuses on historical information with some predictions. What does that mean? Previous year. In other words, I want to know how my revenue dropped for the year. I'm going to look at the previous year and figure out what I did different for the current year. But the managerial, it says many projections and estimates, historical information also presented. The historical information may be presented, but it's not used as much. They estimate everything from day to day, based off of what happened when? Last week, the day before that, whatever they can get their hands on. Focus up information. Notice for financial accounting, the financial statements are for the entire company, right? And if there are some subsidiaries, then they might have some subsidiary statements. But all, all in all, it'll be for the parent company. With managerial accounting, you're gonna notice going through these chapters, you are no longer reporting for just a whole organization. You got to break your reports down per department, per division, per group. It gets very technical, which is why we have very little management accountants and so many financial accountants like CPAs, etc. Nature of information. Financial statements are strictly for the purpose of knowing some monetary information. Do we have cash or are we broke? Managerial, yes, they care about the money too because they got to operate from day to day. So cash inflow and outflow is important, but also non-monetary information is important too. What, what do I mean by non-monetary? Like productivity. Productivity. What else? Quality. Quality. Activity and quality control. In other words, we could be making buku money and we could also be spending it all on a lot of spoilage and a lot of damage because somebody in the freaking department has butter on <laughs> Right? That's how you got to think of that. And so that's why they are so serious about looking all the way down to the last penny. Okay, this is not something that is always talked about, but should be because fraud exists everywhere, not just in financial accounting, but in managerial accounting as well. And it's all about ethics because people do things that are unethical, even if you're, you know, a management accountant or work for a manufacturer. So fraud, it says it's done to pro provide direct or indirect benefit to an employee. Those are the ones that you generally have to worry about the most. Violates the employee's obligations to the employer cost the employer money. Obviously, if somebody is stealing or doing unethical things, that's going to cost the company in the long run, right? And generally, it's hidden from the employer for a long time. Now, the ethical part of that is we have to be able to distinguish from right and wrong. We have to accept certain behavior. And obviously, we want people to only have good behavior, but we also have to be able to accept the fact that some people do not have good behavior, right? So it says Institute of Management Accountants has issued a code of ethics, which they um, totally changed that code however they see fit in most cases.
So types of cost classification. Very important, type of cost classification by behavior. We in managerial accounting as management accountants are concerned about cost behavior. What do we mean by cost behavior? Why do things increase? Why do they decrease? Why have I lost money here? Why have I spent money there? Can I control this cost? Is this uncontrollable? Those are the types of questions that are being asked. So cost behavior, we got fixed cost, variable cost, and mixed cost. And they are exactly what they sound like. If it means fixed cost, that means what? It is steady, constant, does not change based on any kind of activity. Variable cost. It will fluctuate based on activity. Mixed cost. Combination of both. That's why they're showing you these graphs here. This is something you do need to remember because as you start doing your homework, it will make sense. However, if a line on a graph stays constant like that, going straight across, not fluctuating, not going down or up, that's considered fixed. Coming from a zero point here, but constantly going up because activity is constantly going up, that's variable. Here for mixed cost, notice it's somewhere in, in between, right? Didn't quite start here at zero, didn't quite start here at midpoint, but it's constantly going up based on activity. So direct cost and indirect cost, this will haunt you until the day you pass the class, okay? Direct cost and indirect cost. What we know about direct costs are that those costs are the ones that occur because they have been directly related to the production of the product. Okay? Examples they gave you, material and labor costs for the product. Now, I don't want you to confuse labor with or don't combine labor with just all labor. When they say labor here, they're really referring to those hourly people who make this product, okay, and the management who supervises that hourly person. Um, but cost traceable to a single cost object, meaning we can trace it right back to what was made, and we can also say that it came from it being, you know, that process of it being made. Indirect cost, cost that cannot be um, traced to a single cost. So, in other words, something that's going to benefit more than two departments, I'll give you a perfect example. If you had a factory, and obviously you got to keep the factory clean every day, right? After production, everything is closed down. You got to have a janitor, right? It's going to clean. And generally, the driver or the one thing that is going to, um, we're going to be able to allocate costs for that janitor is going to be the square footage of the building. So let's just say the entire building is, is the square footage of 50,000 square feet. Um, that janitor has to clean that entire 50,000 square foot building. How do you allocate the cost for that? Because this is not financial accounting. So you cannot say, oh, we're just going to say that all those janitor costs go towards, you know, Cotton Inc. I don't know. We can't do that because Cotton Inc. has 12 departments. And more than likely, that janitor cleaned every last one of those departments. So what do we do? We single each department out and we see how much of the square footage they occupy. Right? So 12 departments, either they occupy equally or it's different spaces because different areas need wider or larger spaces. Right? That's the only way we can allocate the, the, the cost for janitors. This is why it falls up under indirect because there's no one department to put it towards. It's a couple of them as opposed to, you know, material made for a product that only stemmed out of one department. So we can trace it more easily. The degree of control depends on the level of management in the organization. So what does that say? The senior manager, meaning the person that sits on the phone all day, sits at the desk, works on the computer, talks on the phone, He's over some major stuff, investments, right? Buying more land, buying more buildings, 
buying more equipment for the factories that already exist. However, the supervisor who probably works over all the wage employees, hourly employees, they control daily things like the, the expenses that are incurred by making a product, right? Um, the maintenance that is required to upkeep, and then any overtime worked by those hourly employees. So we got two different types of costs based on relevance. Now, what's the two classifications? Mm -mm. We just talked about them. What's the two classifications so far? Direct and indirect, right? And we do classification by behavior. We do classification by traceability. That's that the whole direct cost and indirect. Um, the cost classification by behavior is whether or not it was fixed, variable, or mixed, okay? That's something you might want to write down, draw you a tree or something. Classification by behavior, whether or not it's fixed cost, variable cost, or mixed cost. Classification by traceability, is it indirect cost or direct cost? Now we got classification by controllability. How are we going to control, is it controllable or uncontrollable, right? That's what that previous slide was for, the controllable or uncontrollable. Looking at what each one, each level of management controls. The executive management level controls the bigger things. The supervisory lower level of management controls day-to-day -day operations and expenses. Now we got to get the classification by relevance. That's the fourth one. Fourth one. What do we mean by relevance? See your book. And it's also I'm on page seven forty now. So classification by relevance means is it a sunk cost or is it an out of pocket cost? If it's a sunk cost, that means that it incurred. We can't do anything about it. We can't change it, right? But even with that, we can't use it to do what? We can't use it to make decisions, right? Look at the example. It says an automobile purchased two years ago cost $15,000. The $15,000 cost is sunk because whether the car is driven, sold, traded, or abandoned, the cost is not going to change. Because we already paid for it. It's done and over with. The event has happened. Out-of-pocket cost requires that we do what? Which means what? We're doing what with our cash? We are saving. So we are saving for a future event. Meaning we know that we're going to purchase the car in the next five months and we have saved consecutively for five months for that car. We chose that amount. We controlled that, right? So that's why it's an out-of-pocket cost because we put money aside for that car and then we decided to go and purchase it and we decided exactly how much we were going to spend. We didn't go somewhere. Now, say if you went to a, a dealership and you wanted to get a car, you had no money saved, and they just put you in a car, but within putting you in a car, they gave you a $500 a month payment as well as a high interest rate. That would be considered sunk, Right. Because you went in there literally with no control over anything. You allowed someone else to flush costs your way and allow you to incur those costs. And after that point, you could not change it. But out of pocket means, oh, I'm not going to go to a dealership. And if I do, I have said I'm going to save $30,000. And that's what I'm going to go to the dealership with so that they cannot get, stick me with a $500 payment. I just want to buy it outright cash. So that's classification by relevance. Now, opportunity cost. How does that change things? So, they're saying that the example they're giving. If you were not attending college, you could be earning 20000 per year. Your opportunity cost of attending college for one year 
is 20,000. All they're saying is you are foregoing, foregoing um, a salary of 20,000 for you to make the choice or alternative to do what? To go to school. We all have been guilty of that. Some of you may be doing that right now, right? Instead of you working and going to school, you would rather focus on school, so that's what you do. And instead, the alternative that you have given up or the opportunity that you have given up is to be working and have a job and make money. I will tell you, a lot of um, CPAs do it. A lot of um, people who want to get the work experience so bad will forego a paying job. That's a great example. Will forego a paying job to get what? An internship or externship so that they can get the experience on their resume. That's called taking an opportunity. Um, people who do things like what I did, I didn't do it, but if I had the option to do it, I would have done it. Um, a lot of people is why sometimes you see older people get doctorates, PhDs, because they have a spouse at home working in the household, all right? So that person works and makes all the money and you forego a great salary so that you can go to school for seven more years and get a PhD. And the opportunity in that is when you graduate, you know that you will have a very high paying job in academia. So it's gonna be different for everybody, right? But that's the whole gist of opportunity cost. Classification by function. And you can write this stuff in your book, you already paid for it, you can't sell it back. Yeah, I did. Right? Okay, so classification by function. What do we mean by classification by function? What um what accounting principle does that support? If you remember that far back. What is it called? How many of you have your books way back from financial one? <laughs> okay, I'm going to read the definition. based on what happened last week, based on what's 
possibly going to happen this week. And every single day when we look at our budgets, we are looking at the expenses and saying whatever they were today is exactly what we're going to record today. Not next week, not tomorrow, because tomorrow may be a whole nother different set of expenses, right? So the way that we are able to do that is we have three different product costs. You have direct labor, direct material, and manufacturing overhead, or you can just simply call it overhead. The direct labor refers to the costs that are associated with producing a product, right? So in other words, all those people, those wage, uh, the laborers that made the product, they're classified under direct labor. The direct materials, that's basically raw materials that were used to produce the product. That falls under direct material. Manufacturing overhead, what do you think goes under there? Indirect labor. And what else? If indirect labor goes under there, what else goes under there? What's up there? What's in the middle? Indirect materials. Right? And indirect is anything that was not directly related to producing the product. So if you're the secretary, you had nothing to do with those pillows we just made 10 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. If you're the accountant, you had nothing to do with us making those 10 pillows. So where they go? Indirect. They go indirect. Manufacturing. Under manufacturing. That's what I want you to write down. All indirect costs go under manufacturing overhead. All indirect costs go under manufacturing overhead. I think I got this one last night for small, very smart. Um, period costs are expenses not attached to the product, which can also be called what? If it's not attached to the product, what is it? Indirect. Indirect, which falls under? Manufacturing. Manufacturing overhead. So they say here, selling costs are incurred to obtain orders to deliver finished goods to customers. Administrative costs are non-manufacturing costs of staff support and administrative functions. So all of those are expenses that are what? Manufacturing overhead. Moving along. Do we send our phone? No, it's on your connect. When you go to that library function in your connect, they have the PowerPoints there. Okay, so okay. Per chapter. Okay. Actually, they have PowerPoints there going all the way back to financial one, if that's what you want it. Um, so they're showing you here with these period and product costs, how all of that transitions to the, the financial statements. So costs incurred were incurred here in 2013, right? Mm -hmm. They broke them out based on period and product. Obviously product is only going to center around inventory. That's all they care about. Period is going to be around the expenses. Mm -hmm. Product costs, the inventory that was actually sold that year is transitioned over to the income statement under cost of goods sold. Also, the inventory that was not sold until the next year was placed on the balance sheet as these three items, and we're going to talk about these in detail, and then transition to the inventory sold in 2014 going up to cost of goods sold for the 2014 income statement. So, you know how we talked about all those classifications, right? Three different ones. Behavior, traceability, function. What's the behavior? If it's a what? Mix. Fixed, yeah. variable, yeah. or mix. Yeah. What's the traceability? Direct, direct, direct or direct. indirect. What's the function? Product, Product or period cost. So, bicycle tires. The behavior is that those are variable costs. Why do we say they're variable? Different sizes. It's going to change based on what? Terrain and climate. I don't think we will get that far. 
All right, what about traceability, whether or not it's a direct or an indirect? How do we know it's direct? It goes on what? On the bike, right? The bike is the product. So yes, it's direct. And we know it's a product by function. Wages of the assembly worker, that's the person that puts the bike together. Those costs are going to be what? Variable based on what? How many days? You get two technical. <laughs> Not experience. Based on the amount of hours worked, right? Because we know that assembly workers are going to work different hours. They're also going to be paid differently. Everybody does not get paid the same, right? And then by traceability, we know that's direct because the person puts together the product. And then it is a product by nature. Advertising. Why is it fixed? No, it had nothing to do. It's going to be the same. Exactly. Now, the traceability. Indirect. Because advertising had nothing to do with them putting their bike together. Right? And then period cost. Obviously, we don't do advertising as soon as we finish one bike at a time. Right? We wait till a production is finished. Then we do the same advertising for every run. Production manager salary. This is the person that supervised these assembly workers. Why is it fixed? He probably gets the salary, right? And traceability. Indirect. Now, that's kind of iffy. Why is it indirect? If he was the person that supervised those who actually made these bicycles, why is that considered indirect? He didn't touch anything. He just kind of overviewed. Supervised. That's all. Supervised. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> the people who put the bikes together, right? And then function, obviously, it's product by nature. Yes. Depreciation. Office depreciation. Meaning, had nothing to do with the equipment that was making the bicycle. But it did occur. It's fixed. You remember straight line depreciation, right? Same concept. What about traceability? Why is it indirect? It has nothing to do with production of the product, and then obviously because it is indirect, it's an expense, and it is a period cost, right? Good, you catch on fast. Fast, fast. Okay, concept, cost concepts for service company. So, service organizations are those who provide a service, don't produce a product of any nature, but provide a service for profit, right? It says, example, the cost of beverages for passengers of Southwest Airlines is a variable cost based on number of passengers. Can we reasonably say that, if we're using the airline example, can we reasonably say that the tickets for the airlines are variable or fixed? Yeah, variable. Why? Because you got Because it's based on the number of passengers. Different prices. What else? Well, that's fixed because each plane has a certain number of seats, right? So they know how many they need to fill. And generally, the only way it will turn into variable, that's more like a mixed cost, actually. The only way it will turn into variable is if you got 50 seats on the plane and you only fill 30 of them. Obviously, what was expected for that won't be. What were you saying, Ms. Foster? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know what I was saying. I was saying um, it also depends on how far the plane has to go because then gas. And all right. Like the fuel, right? Okay. So typical manufacturing costs in today's product. What they're saying here is within looking in the budgets and looking at the cost, direct materials make up for the majority, 45% of today's cost. Direct labor is 15%. How can that be? Yeah. How can that be? Direct materials, 45% in factory overhead, meaning the indirect labor, the people who sit on their butts every day it's in the office are taking up 40% of costs. Oh, no. It's time for somebody to get fired, <laughs> right? Because it's no way the people who make the product, it's only 15% of them, and then it's 40% of the secretaries, the person who probably go empty, empties the trash, you know, uh, the person who answers the phone, I don't know. All the people that work in the office. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. We're looking at people or are we looking at actual costs? 
Both. Okay. Both. Because what are some, we, we always focus on the labor itself, but what are the other indirect costs? You know how we talk about advertising? What else? Selling expenses? Uh, salaries, that's the labor part. Other things that companies incur, supplies. They also have to have office equipment. All of that stuff is under factory overhead because it is considered to be indirect. Okay, so direct materials, this is where they really break it down. Direct materials or raw materials are the expenditures for direct materials that are separately and readily traced through the manufacturing process of the finished goods. So the steel used to make the frame of the little bike is considered a raw material. What else on that bike would be considered raw? The rubber for the tire. The rubber for the tire. What else? The cable. The weight. The who? The cable. The brake. The, the little thingy. Okay. The the boat. The, the, the all that stuff goes together, right, to make the bike. Mm -hmm. What about the labor? Without even reading that, mm -hmm. what is the direct labor for? The, the people who put put the stuff together, their direct labor, factory overhead. We already talked about this. Indirect labor, indirect material, utility costs, rent, things like that. And I'll tell you how those are broken down later. Supervisory costs, meaning those people who just supervise, <laughs> they're under indirect. <laughs> Prime and conversion costs. This is important. What do we mean by prime and conversion costs? So let me see what page I'm on at this point. 743. Look at you. Okay, 743. Mm -hmm. What are we talking about with prime and conversion costs? Direct material costs and direct labor costs are prime costs. And then conversion costs are basically direct labor and indirect costs at what? Manufacturing. That what though? Conversion what? What's the conversion part? Raw materials to finish goods. So the cost that had nothing to do with raw materials over to finish goods are just considered prime costs. But if it has something to do with raw materials going over to finished goods, it is considered conversion. Now, with that being said, direct material or raw material, why is that not here instead of direct labor? I don't know. You do. Think about it. Why is direct material a prime cost but not a conversion cost? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You'll learn it later in another chapter. But the reason... The reason for this, the conversion itself from raw materials to finished goods, the process goes raw materials, goods in process, finished goods. Raw materials automatically get converted to goods in process. Okay? Meaning so the product is stuck in between. It's not yet raw. It's not raw anymore, but it's also not finished. So that's the converting part. This is why we just use direct material as a prime cost, not necessarily conversion, because we already know it's an assumption. It's implied that it will be converted. So this is what you've known as far as reporting up until this class. Before, in financial accounting, you only dealt with merchandisers, meaning you only dealt with the people who brought, bought already finished product, right, and sold it for a profit. And they also accounted for the cost of their product that they purchased. In this case, that's what this part refers to. Merchandisers buy goods that are already finished from other manufacturers. They sell those finished goods for a profit. Manufacturers, however, they buy it raw. Whatever material they need to make a product, they buy it from its bare bones, raw, and then they produce and sell whatever they finish, probably at a wholesale cost. What's the difference on the balance sheet between a manufacturer and a merchandiser? Before, you've been used to cash, receivables, and merchandise inventory, meaning the merchandise that you have purchased from a manufacturer. Now that you're doing managerial accounting, you're still concerned with cash and receivables, 
but your inventory has broken down three more ways. What I was explaining in the previous slide, right? Raw materials, goods in process, and finished goods. So look at that. Those are these three processes, right? Three inventories, bless you. Raw materials, the materials that are waiting to be processed, bless you, can be direct or indirect. Goods in process, partially complete. You may have gotten 5,000 in raw materials. You may have only produced half of that. That half that you produce is considered to be in process because it's not quite finished, but it's also no longer what? Raw, raw materials. Material to which some labor and or overhead head have been added. And then, of course, finished goods. You've completed it, and it's ready to be sold. So where are we are going to put the prime cost? Prime cost. Let's go back and look at this part. You remember how I said raw materials is just implied that it will go to goods in process because the whole purpose of this you know, process is to take raw materials and turn them into product? Here, it's already implied we're going to change this to what? So goods in process. The prime at this point is raw materials or direct materials mm -hmm. and the labor that goes along with getting it to this point. Okay. That's the direct labor. Those are the prime costs and the rest of it will be considered what? So now we look at how the income statement is broken down. Before what you were used to, starting with beginning merchandise inventory, adding whatever you purchased, subtracting any inventory, right? Now with the manufacturer, you starting with what is beginning and finished goods inventory, adding the cost of goods that you manufacture, so that's the goods in process area, right? And then subtracting what? What you have completed or the finished goods. Good. And all of it leads down to cost of goods sold. So, activities and cost flows in manufacturing. It's a lot going on, right? Starting off again, raw materials beginning plus anything that was purchased through the year needs to be added. That, I'm sorry, yes, coming over here to raw materials used. We know that they're used because that's the goods in process area. They've been used and they've been used to make product that is partially completed. So we start with the goods in process beginning inventory, raw materials, direct labor use, factory overhead use, all of that goes on the balance sheet, right? When we get to the income statement, all we're concerned about is how much of this was finished and goods manufactured costs. Meaning the stuff that was in goods and process, how much did it cost us? So look at this. This is important. It's the difference between cost of goods sold and cost of goods manufactured. The cost of goods manufactured factors in what's in process. Because remember, it's not raw materials anymore, but it's also not finished. It's partially complete, right? So we start off with direct materials that have been used. Direct labor, we add that. We also add any indirect cost, factory overhead, to get our total manufacturing. Then we have to add in beginning work in process and subtract what? Any work in pro process to get the cost of goods. Mm. And that's just showing you a, man, a manufacturing statement showing how the goods go from raw materials all the way down to work in process. It should be. Which one? The one before this, probably. Yeah. This, yeah. this one, I didn't see. That probably isn't in there, so you probably yeah. need to write it's that in down. A, it's in a paragraph. Oh, I see. It's not like a.
So write this down because apparently it's broken down into a paragraph, not set up like this. You said you can find it at. Um, yeah, but I'm just going to remember to do it. You're going to be the only one to remember to do it. I will. I know it. <laughs> and normally every week going forward, you guys will get a break. It's just this week because I'm letting you go early. There's just no point in getting your break. That's smart. You're just smart. Um, mm -hmm. Hurt your hand going all the way. <laughs> you know. But um, you'll definitely get break there. Right. You, you just have to remind me after a certain while because I'll just I don't um, know. I will do it. Yeah. Yep, I, I'll, I'll turn it here. I won't. I won't. Go ahead and write that down. No, I'm not going to write it. I'm not. Well, take your smart picture. Yeah. For your smartphone. Then we're going to talk about one last thing. I don't see well. So I have to go close. Okay, I got it. Okay. Does everybody have it? Yeah, go ahead and get that. Everybody has it on? Yeah. Okay. One last thing, trends in managerial accounting. So these are the six trends. And somewhere in the class, in the course, before we get to the last chapter, we talk about a lot of these trends. First, starting with customer orientation. What do they mean about customer orientation? Like customer service? Right. Even though it's a manufacturing company, they still have customers too. It may not be a consumer like me or you, right? Yeah, it needs the stores. Right. The store, the merchandisers, the ones who purchase the product to resell, those are their customers. So they have to get in the habit of making sure that they are satisfying that whole supply and demand. Um you make a good product, obviously merchandisers want to buy it from you so that they can sell their product in their store or their business. So you got to make sure that you know exactly what the demand is, what the trend is out there as far as prices, as far as uh, how you need to sell it. And then global economy. So what does that mean? That's relatively simple. Com competitors, yeah. competitors, right? You will not be the only manufacturer yeah. out there producing things. So you have to make sure you know whatever is going on out there in the economy, what, what is hot. Like your peers, like what? Your peers, peers. your peers are doing. Like for the your peers, peers. Yeah. yeah. You have to know that. You have to know that so that you can, one, make it your business better, but you also want to have what they call um, market uh, dominance, meaning who's the leader in tissue, Charmin, or do they do, maybe, you guys use tissue, I mean, you hate them, girl. Oh, angel yeah. slides up there. Okay. How about paper towels? Bounty? Yeah. Bounty is like the leading. Um, How about the car? Honda? I see Honda. Honda? Really? I don't know if they're the leading. Top three. The top three. Yeah. Japanese. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know about that. I guess they're okay. Honda is good. I'm not a Honda person, but. Nissan is good. Yeah, I haven't ever owned a Nissan. I don't know about that one. I haven't ever owned a Toyota. So you got him back, sir? Yeah, right. I wish. Yeah, I'm not the kind of 
I put some very practical purpose, you know? Like as long as it dries, it's not a hoop thing. Yeah, I want to challenge it. It can give me point A to point B. But if I had to, if I had to just choose that um it's not the beauty. Beauty. Um, 